I, I would say the modern definition of what a war game is would start probably in the late 1800s. It was in Prussia around, I think it was 1780. The military officers and aristocrats started creating these games as a way to help teach young, upcoming aristocratic families, and we're going to be leaders, how to conduct war properly. One of the first games that was created was based on uh, the game of chess. It includes units for cavalry, artillery, infantry, and then different support units. There were way more squares than there are in a typical chess game. There was terrain indicated on the board, but units could only move forward. They couldn't move laterally or diagonally. Fire was limited to whichever way you were facing. The leadership in Prussia started to see that there was an opportunity here. They start to expand it. Each iteration is trying to make it more, you know, quote unquote, realistic, figuring out elements that will help train people to understand how terrain, movement, whatever it is, is going to impact decisions made on a battlefield that could be the turning point in a war. Most people would say the culmination of all that comes in 1824 with Kriegspiel. Kriegspiel is a game that the Blackmore Bunch in Minneapolis and, and uh St. Paul, the Twin Cities area, they were looking back towards that kind of game as far as, as having rules for conducting their miniatures war games, even though those rules weren't necessarily created for the general public. In Kriegspiels, it's a turning point in terms of trying to create a standardized set of rules. Prussian tradition of playing these war games is going to be partly responsible for helping the Prussians win in the Franco-Prussian War. The Prussians had a tradition of practicing and playing these war games to help them understand all the different variables that might affect the outcome of a battle. Um, I did a video on the California game designer tradition that grew up right after Dungeons and Dragons is published, right? How different that tradition was versus the tradition in the Midwest, Minneapolis, St. Paul, and um, Lake Geneva being the two primary areas where those traditions were much more based in war games. In, in the Midwest. And in California, it was much more fiction-based. It was it was less about war games rules, and it was more about, like, what if we tried this? And the, like, people figuring out how to implement things that they'd read about, like I said, in fiction. It, it, was, a, it was a much different vibe in the California scene. And somebody mentioned in the comments that part of it might be due to the fact that much of the Midwest was settled by German immigrants and they had this tradition of war gaming that they had grown up with. And I found that fascinating because I had never even considered that that might be part of the reason why you have that more of a war game tradition in the Midwest versus this more free-for-all is a flexible, very different approach out in California where I live now. In 19... 12 H.G. Wells, the author, is going to write a set of rules called Little Wars. It is a set of rules for using model soldiers, which were very popular, using these toys with these brightly colored miniatures and armies that depict all different types of soldiers, like I said, infantry, cavalry, artillery, whatever, having a set of rules so that you can conduct battles. Now, H.T. Wells's rules are a little bit different because there's not like dice like we're used to, but battles were resolved based on mostly just how many figures did you have on each side. For things like art artillery, you actually would use a toy catapult and fire miniature projectiles to knock down enemy troops. That was kind of the H.G. Wells Little Wars rules. So that's 1912. That's right before World War I. There's going to be a halt on kind of like making these types of soldiers because there was a scarcity of lead and tin because they were being used for the war effort. So his rules don't necessarily jump into the public consciousness and they don't like take off the way that they maybe could have had those two world wars not happened. Part of the hobby is just collecting them. It's 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 almost like bragging rights. It's definitely not a poor man's hobby. And you have people collecting these model soldiers to display them because they look cool, but people weren't necessarily doing a lot with them. In the 1950s is where things really, really start to pick up. You have the creation of um, the Avalon Hill Game Company, and they're going to publish a game called Gettysburg. 
which comes out in, I think it was 1957. Gettysburg was played very, very frequently by the people who were going to end up creating Dungeons and Dragons. It was common among the different groups, whether they're in the Twin Cities area at Minneapolis, St. Paul, or whether they're in Lake Geneva. Avalon Hill, they start publishing a magazine called The General. Almost immediately thereafter, you have the creation of another magazine called Strategy and Tactics, which is going to publish a complete set of war games rules every month. It's not just Napoleonics. You've got Civil War and Revolutionary War, and you're going to start to have the different world wars, and you're going to have medieval war games. Because it's evolving naturally from people that are collecting these figures, and they're trying to figure out what to do with them. So a lot of times people are creating their own rules, and then they're sharing them with their friends. And they are saying, well, these are the rules that I made. And sometimes if you had the means, maybe you are mimeographing off a set of rules and people are running off copies of these and distributing them with people at conventions who might play in the game or might just watch people playing the game and they're seeing what's happening and then they're saying, well, this is what I would change. And then they're going home and adapting their own set of rules from what they just saw happen at the convention, right? And they're creating their own set and then they're sharing with their friends and then they're going to go to a convention and run a, a seminar or a game and people are going to play and then those people are going to be like, oh, that's cool, but I, I want to do it this way. And it's this constant adapting and bringing in and taking in these rules that people are sharing and they're sharing them freely, okay? So most people aren't charging for the stuff and when they're running off these mimeographs or like passing them out and they're sharing these ideas and then people are taking those ideas and they're changing them and twisting them and being, you know, completely rearranging them and then sharing them again and then those get changed and then shared again and again. And it's this like constant evolution of people sharing these ideas coming out of a love from, of, of this hobby of playing these miniatures war games with these model soldiers. And you've got magazines or, and you've got, you know, zines like fan-made zines and you've got newsletters. You have organizations popping up about that are dedicated to playing these miniatures war games. And they publish newsletters to publish rules in them. And then you've got conventions where rules are being shared. So, it, you know, in modern parlance, it was sort of like an open source, right? People are taking each other's rules and they're building on them. It's like an open game license. And then they're sharing them again and sharing them again over and over again. And these rules are very, very sparse, again, by modern standards for the most part. So that means they're very hackable because you can look at it and go, well, I like this rule, but I don't like this one. And I want to add this one and change this. And I'm going to include this other thing. And then I was in this other game and they did it this way. So I'm going to tack that on. And so it, and then you're going to share that, right? So then people are going to see what you've done with it. So this is the environment that Gygax, you know, Gary Gygax and Jeff Perrin, and, but also Dave Arneson and, again, the Blackmore Bench, they're all growing up in this environment of this, like, completely open and shared universe of people sharing these rules, okay? Chainmail is coming from all of that. It's not being developed in a vacuum. Now, with hindsight, we tend to look back at like years of publication and go, well, this was created then, and then it spawned this other thing, and then this happened, and then this happened. And so, you know, again, I've seen a lot of people say that Chainmail is directly responsible for the creation of Dungeons and Dragons, and it is just one of multiple resources, including things that influenced the creating the creation of Chainmail in the first place that helped get us to the creation of Dungeons and Dragons.